Yeah. You first. I was on alone for a minute. No, I, uh, we went together and, uh, it was a lot of fun, I'll say that. It was, because at the time when, when we went to do this, we got to Vancouver, we knew there was a little cash prize, they said there would be some kind of cash prize. We had no idea there was a half million dollars in play until we got there. And it kind of stunned us all that there was that much money involved. Um, we were all looking forward to it. And, you know, unfortunately for me, me and uh, me and canines have an issue. Me and dogs do not get along. He's witnessed it firsthand. I can attest to that. They hate him. <laughs> <laughs> We've been in traffic and dogs in a car and they look over and see him and they're like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> trying to get through the glass. We were in Las Vegas, driving down Las Vegas Boulevard. And he's laughing. I'm like, what? He's like, look out the window. There's, There's a German th Shepherd over there just all in the glass. He's <laughs> bark teeth are hitting the glass. And he's just losing his mind. And he's looking at him. Yeah, looking right at me. We were at a we were at a gun range in Las Vegas at an event for the shot show out there, and these people come in with a German Shepherd, and as soon as it saw me, it started barking and raising hell, and they're like, "Whoa, we're so sorry, we don't know what's wrong." I'm like, "It's not your dog. Your dog's fine. It's, it ain't gonna bark at nobody else, I promise you." And I turn around, and we're standing there talking to Marcus Luttrell and people like that, and we're talking, and just a few minutes later, I'm like, "Ugh!" He's on my leg. He's biting the hell out of me. And, uh, it got it. I saw it coming too. I couldn't warn him. I didn't have time. I was like, oh, no. got it. I saw the smile. Turn again. Turn again. I should have went, but I didn't. So when we were on, a, when, when, when I was on Vancouver Island, I had a pretty decent place. I had a nice shelter set up. I was comfortable. I was good to go. And on the second night, three wolves came into my camp. And I don't mean three wolves walked into my camp and I saw them. I mean three wolves came crashing down this ridge. They were fighting, fornicating, killing something. I don't know what they were up to, but it was loud. And, uh, and they got really, really close, like within like 30 feet of me close. And uh, yeah, I was terrified. Because I know what me and dogs do. And I'm like, if once soon as they realize I'm here, I'm done. I'm laying here in this take-home sack, you know. They're going to grab this sleeping bag and away I'm going to go. Um, and so, yeah, I, that caused me to tap. Now, if it happened during the daytime, would it have scared me? Absolutely, yeah. Maybe not as bad. Maybe I would have stayed around. But um, I know what me and dogs will do, and I didn't need to stick around to see. You know, I'm sitting there going, I could be home breaking damn books. I'm getting the hell out of here. You know? um, but yeah, that was that was my adventure on Vancouver Island. It didn't last that long. And I remember when the boat came to get me, and I was talking to the producer. I'm like, man, I said, I can't believe I'm the first one out. And he goes, you're not. And I went, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> but for someone that had a little bit more time on the island, just a little bit. That's what the pepper spray was for, was to season, season the meat. Yes, it was they the like season. Like it's classic. Yeah. Hey, everybody said, you got pepper spray, you had a bow, you had all this. And he can attest to this. Vancouver Island is so dark at night. It's like being underground. I would lay in my shelter at night with my hand like this going... There it is. I didn't see that coming. There was a big, my shelter was made up against this huge spruce tree, probably a thousand years old. This thing was massive. And I would come out of there at night and I'd put my hand on the tree and I'd walk around this tree and I'd stand there and, and then I'd go, I'd walk back around that tree and never take my hand off of it because I knew as soon as I did, I'd be like, and I wouldn't be able to find my way back. So I never let go of that damn spruce tree at night. <laughs> And so people are like, well, why didn't you stab it with a knife? You had a bow. Yeah, my bow. I had a bow. It was disassembled in my shelter. Let's play that Jenga game in the dark. <laughs> Strings and sticks. And, um, and you got pepper spray. I don't know how many of you have ever used pepper spray. It works just as good on you as it does whatever you're spraying it on. I've experienced it many times. Um, and every person is different, you know. For me, that was that was the, the worst thing that could have happened to me. I'm not afraid of bears. I've had bear encounters. i got video of bears climbing up the tree I'm hunting out of and me hitting them in the nose with an arrow and they climb back down. So I'm not afraid of bears. But um, we were all concerned about cougars because they're legit. You'll know they're there when they hit your back. And then, then the wolf thing, which I was like, okay, there's wolves. Yeah, something to think about. Never even dreamed I'd see one. And I never did see them. I never did see them. But uh, they were there, nonetheless. So, anyway, back to that. 
My name is uh, Alan Kay. I'm a Leo. I enjoy uh, Cabernet Sauvignon and moonlit walks on the beach. And I'd like to talk to you about bowel movements. Or the lack thereof for 30 days. During my time on the island, I went 21 days without a bowel movement. No shit. So, so when we tell you he's full of shit, he's full of shit. His relative. No, the reason I bring that up, you know, preppers are all about their toilet paper, right? They got these cords of toilet paper stacked cords up. Cords of toilet paper. You're not going to need that stuff. <laughs> when you get down to a, a subsistence diet, there's not much coming in, there ain't much coming out. So you're set. I just wanted to put you at ease on that. Okay? You're good. All them phone books for no reason. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, starvation can be pleasant. Uh, I lost 60 pounds up there. What you have to do is you have to stay hydrated and just eat a little bit of something, you know, just to keep your system going. People think we need a lot more food than we really do. Um, probably one of the most important pieces of equipment, people usually want to talk about my knife or my axe or something like that. It's kind of got some testosterone around it. But actually the, the uh, best thing I had was a metal container. You know, something to boil water in. I can improvise a cutting edge. I can do a lot of other things. It's really hard to improvise a metal container, though, to purify water, cook soups, things like that. Everybody, so, yeah, everybody wants to say, oh, I'll burn me out a bowl and I'll rock boil. Anybody ever done that rock boiling? Time consuming. Time consuming tastes like shit when you're done with it. <laughs> Think about it. Hot rocks, it's full of dirt. You make mud. That's what you make. It's not as cool as those bushcraft guys make it out to be. I've done it. It's not fun. Yeah. And it's time consuming. Very time consuming. It's assuming that you're going to be in one place long enough to do a lot of that stuff. So if you're trying to get somewhere, if you're on the move, you need things that you can pick up, take with you, stop, boil your water, and carry that with you in a container. So a metal container is a big thing. I like metal containers so much. Those of you that have been in the bug out bag class <laughs> have seen it. I carry this every day of my life as part of getting dressed. It's a pocket survival kit, and it's in a metal container so that even the container is useful. It's something I can boil water in and cook in. And uh, we can go through the contents later for those of you that haven't seen it. If you want to come up here, I'll break it down for you. But uh, that's kind of my thing is I want to help people get lighter in their equipment. I do a lot of assessments and training all over the country. And I'll show up and do an assessment of their preps, their security, their, their bug out bags, whatever you want to call them. And so I'm looking at a lady and she's 70 years old and she's got this big huge rucksack that looks like a Marine Corps Expeditionary Forces <laughs> Tenth rucksack. Mountain unit or something, you know. Yeah, and I'm looking at that and I'm looking at her and I'm thinking, yeah, she's not going to ever be able to carry this. My pack weighs around 15 pounds. So focus on what you really, really need. What's going to kill us first, statistically, is going to be hypothermia. Okay, you're going to be out there. That can kill you your first night out. You need to learn how to guard your core temp. Okay, that's the main thing. You've got time on food. Most Americans have plenty of time on food. <laughs> exactly. You ain't going to die, okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to die from that. So you want to maintain that core temp, and you want to stay hydrated and keep your mindset straight. If you can do those things, you're going to be okay. So I, I tend to build my equipment around, you know, what can I do, like as far as a shelter sheet, something that's going to protect me from wind, from rain, Keep me dry, keep me comfortable. I do need to sleep. I mean, you need to, you need to be rested so that your mind's operating well and that you're making good decisions and you need good, clean water and a way to carry and purify that. And so, like Chris said, you know, the uh, in America we tend to be very material-driven. We're all about the stuff, but it's really about the knowledge. Those of you that have done the weed walks with me realize that just on this property, we didn't even have to leave the property, we found soap, rope, fire making materials, containers, medicine, and a bunch of food. So a lot of it is knowledge, it really is. So that's why I really don't carry a lot of food in my pack. I'm not gonna starve, because I mean, I could eat pretty much anything out there. I've seen me do it, I'll eat whatever, like literally. Yeah, for yeah. real. Stuff that even maggots pass on, they're like, nah, we're good. <laughs> Just cook it well, you know, burn it, it'll be fine. But, uh, so yeah, try to keep your packs light. And, and it, as we were doing the bug out classes, I would ask people, okay, so who has their bug out bag with them in their vehicle? And like 98% of the people did not have one. Or if they did, it was at home. So our, our equipment should be carried in our vehicle. Because how did you all get here today? 
You drove here, right? So your vehicle is going to be your closest resupply point. No matter where you are, chances are you drove there. And since you're mounted, since that vehicle is, is the beast of burden, it's carrying all that weight. So in my truck, hey, I've got six gallons of water in there behind the seat. I've got a full med kit. I've got two or three different rucksacks. I've got all kinds of good stuff in there because the vehicle's carrying the weight. But when that switches and now I'm dismounted and I'm on foot and I'm trying to get somewhere, I'm going to get much, much lighter. And that's what that one small bag that I carry is for. And I would encourage you to really explore, A, have your, have your stuff with you. And just like with the weapon retention class, I asked people, how many people here carry? A lot of hands went up. I said, how many people have it on you now? Eh, it's at home, it's in the car, it's in the glove box, it's in the purse, it's this to that. It's no good if it's not on you. You have to make this part of your daily life. This is not something you're just going to put up and use later. It needs to be something that's part of your modality now. When I get dressed every day of my life, I put on a med kit, a tourniquet, a survival kit, a knife, and a firearm just to check the mail. That's just, if I'm dressed, that's part of what I put on. Uh, I, I used a tourniquet once. First time I used it, I was at a Dairy Queen minding my own business, eating an M&M Blizzard. And it was summertime and I was outside under the little table with the umbrella and witnessed a motorcycle get T-boned. The guy's leg came off from the knee down. It's like, boom, problem. So it doesn't have to be some apocalyptic deal. Uh, Sam Splint, first time I used a Sam Splint, high-tech ninja training was on a three-year-old in Chuck E. Cheese. I had him up on the table. My son had a tib-fib spiral fracture, which I didn't know but suspected some kind of break. Fashioned a cast out of it right there on the playground with everybody running around because I had the med kit with me. Okay? I've come up on car wrecks with people that needed help, used the med kit for that. Uh, my daughter, when she was about two, sucked a little plastic bead into her nose, and I was trying to get her to blow it out, but every time she kept sucking deeper, and so I'm thinking, okay, what do I do? And I had, I was giving her pepper, and then she sneezed, and a long train of pepper encrusted stuff came out, but the, the little green bead was still in there, and I couldn't see it. I had one of my other kids tell me, yeah, it's in there for real. We saw her snort it down, and I'm thinking, if she sucks it in, it's going to block her airway. She's going to die. So I cover her mouth, cover the, uh, cover that nostril, and then the, the open nostril and blew into it really hard through that hole next to her mouth and that jet of air came out and shot out the little green bead along with about that much phlegm that came and stuck to my face. But either way, see all this medical stuff that we train for, when I'm training for it, we're out there and there's guns going off and we're in camo and we're thinking, hey, we're going to do this and it's going to be some big thing. That's not how it plays out. It's kids on playgrounds, it's car wrecks, it's motorcycle wrecks, it's stuff like that. Uh, my mother had a kidney stone, came to my house, she was ready to go to the ER. I treated her with a plant, Pipsisawa. She never had to go anywhere, the kidney stone, done. Just last, well, two weeks ago, my father-in-law uh, was bitten by a brown recluse, spider right between his shoulder blades. Uh, I treated that, and he was having some deep pain and started to see a little bit of the necrosis happening, all the signs that are indicative of that. And uh, so using the inner bark of a plant, seven bark, also called wild hydrangea, treated that. And so, I mean, we're, this is stuff that I use all the time, every day. I dress a certain way. You won't see me in cotton clothing, okay? Back to what kills us first, hypothermia. Just remember this, these two words, cotton kills. Cotton kills. I can't say it enough. There, there came a time in my life when I came home and I threw away everything I had that was cotton. I was just making trips from the bedroom to the kitchen trash can with armloads full of cotton stuff and stuff in it. And my wife's looking at me like... Hmm, what's up? And I explained, <laughs> I explained to her, yeah, uh, this stuff never dries out. You ever had a wet pair of blue jeans? You got caught out in the rain and they're just sticking to you? you you'll be either a heat casualty or a hypothermia casualty or it's going to chase or rub, a mobility casualty. Mobility casualty. Get rid of cotton. Okay? Wool socks is all I own. The best company out there, and I don't own stock in it, is Darn Tough. Darn tough. Get by those wool socks. They come in different thicknesses. Yes, even in the summer, I wear them. You can wear them for weeks and they don't stink because they don't hold the moisture in. They're antimicrobial. All right? Cotton holds moisture so it doesn't dry out. And, and your clothing, we think about shelter and they think about TPs and lean tos. Your shelter, your most immediate shelter is when you get dressed every morning. That is the first layer of your shelter system is the clothing you wear. So you need to dress appropriately for the weather. Do you remember a couple of years ago in Atlanta, a little bit of snow came, a little bit of ice. And in the southeast, that's all it takes, baby. We're locked down. 
And for three, four days, people are camping out in their cars. When they left the house that morning, they thought, oh, I'll come back to my warm bed at night. Three days later, didn't make it home. The so, National Guard's out there getting them out of their cars. Yeah. The National Guard. So if their car, which is their closest resupply point, was stopped, right, at some road, sleep system, a little bit of chow, a little bit of water, yeah, Fair then boots. they would have been golden. But also dress appropriately. If you do get caught out in the elements, have the stuff on you. But most importantly, have that knowledge. So let's look at what, what does it mean to be a human being on earth? What does it take for us to sustain our own existence? Hands, we covered this already. Yeah, because, I mean, we're really not, we're the only thing in nature that cannot, as by and large, some of us can, but as, as a group, as a collective, human beings cannot sustain their own life in their God-given environment. We have devolved that far. Okay? So let's look at what we need. We need water, shelter, fire, food, and protection. Protection thinking of self-defense slash your medical stuff, okay? Those five things, is, that's pretty much it. And the protection don't happen that much. Really, it's water, shelter, fire, food. I know a lot of people think about the tactical end of it, the defensive end out of it, but like Chris alluded to, you're not fighting every day. Even in a war zone, you don't fight every day. There's, there's intense battle happening, and then it's boredom. And the sanitation has got to happen every day. The water has to happen every day. During the battle of, I want to say Vicksburg, or Fredericksburg. One of those Bergs. A lot of Bergs in the Civil War. A lot of Bergs. But it was one of them. 44% of the Confederate Army, 44% was unable to carry out their military duty. Out of that 44%, only 4% were combat wounded. The rest of it, dysentery. Bad hand washing, not handling our, our cooking equipment, not cleaning that, not handling our human waste. Most likely it was fecal oral transfer just from bad sanitation. Yeah, uh, bad food stores, things like that, foodborne illnesses. And, and that's the stuff, it's the little things like that that'll get you, that, that we're really not thinking about. And another thing to think about is fear. Our society is fear-driven, fear-based. Everybody's cowed down, afraid. I don't want to talk to my neighbor. I don't want to know what I've got. I, I, don't, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. Everything is fear. You need to abandon fear. Do not allow yourself to be governed by fear. This is your home. You were meant and designed by the Creator to live on the earth. Don't fear anything on it or in it. Go out there and take your rightful place, do what you do, and help each other. Because in the end, it's going to come down to community. Okay, if you don't know your neighbors, just reach out to them. Just stop by with a jar of honey. Hi, I'm your neighbor. Here's a jar of honey. You know, and I've done that. Saw that you just moved into the neighborhood, thought you might like some honey. I'm looking at them, they're looking at me. We're breaking the ice, I'm getting a little little sense of who they are, their sense of who I am, and I just throw it out there. Hey, if you ever need me, I live down there, the house in the hole right there, that's me. If I can ever help you in any way, you know, swing by. I'm not afraid of them. If they come over and they start some stuff, I'll take them out. I don't care. So I, <laughs> there's no need to be afraid of them. I'm, I'm, I'm coming at them from a good place in my heart. I'm going to help you, okay? Everybody's got their beans piled up, and I'll kill anybody that comes to take them. I'm not like that. If you want beans and I've got them, come, sit around the fire. We'll, you know, I'll share anything I've got with you. Because it's going to come down to community. No one person can do anything, okay? No I'm one really, family. Yeah, no one family even. I'm really, really good at some things. He's really, really good at some things. And there's people that are good at the stuff that I'm not good at. So together there's that symbiotic relation that we can have. <laughs> it's not profit-driven. It's just I fill your voids and you will fill my voids. And we'll all level it out and get through whatever situation it is because we have that collective knowledge. So it really does boil down to community. So, you know, don't overthink this stuff and don't get overwhelmed about it. I see a lot of people driven by fear and they think they've got to have tons and tons of stuff. Sure, you should have some food storage. Sure, you should have a weapon and all that, but the main thing is knowing how to use it. I would dare say 99% of the people in this country carrying weapons do not know how to use them in a real world situation under stress, being attacked with it. Carrying a paintbrush does not make you an artist, okay? It's just an inanimate object. That's all it is. Ultimately, you're the weapon. You're a modular weapon system. So you have to, you have to train yourself. You have to take care of yourself mentally and spiritually and stay right that way, and the rest will fall into place.